Thank you so much, the two of you, for being here today. So I would like to get everybody to know you two a little bit better. Um, and for this, I want to start in your history and so to say back, back in your history. And my first question to Jutta is, um, when you were a little girl, um, what were your aspirations? What did you want to be? Um, and did you envision that one day you would be sitting right here in our Aspen um, talk? <laughs> and Jutta, could you turn, wait, wait, um, could you turn on your mic? I think, thank you, you're still muted. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Stormy again, thank you for having Kimberly and me here on this wonderful Aspen platform. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here and see so many familiar faces and names. Um, when I was a little girl, or even not so little anymore, like 10, I had found it like a girl's gang. We were like an investigative group of detectives and wanted to solve old cases and we were wondering to the police and asking them do you have cases for us which we could solve so i mean we were not really successful in this but later on this investigative approach stayed with me when i sort of entered journalism and you know, traveled the world interviewed many many leaders made reportages from different parts of the world um, and i think this approach of being very curious and wanting to learn what is behind the surface helped me also later on in my life, even in, in, you know, in our diplomatic postings, it was always a challenge to look beyond. You now, what do people really mean? What do they think about us? How can we sort of make ourselves understood? So maybe, you know, this investigative gene somehow is still with me. <laughs> So I do have to ask, how did the police react when two little girls came and asked them for unsolved cases? Yeah, they asked us if you wanted to come to the crime scene. And I think the first crime scene, which was a rather harmless thing, we sort of shied away. <laughs> and so they were, not, they were not too impressed. And we wanted to have boys with us all the time, but the boys simply didn't want to come. So that was our big disappointment at that time. Great, thank you so much. Um, investigative journalism, thanks, thanks so much. And, and for you, um, uh, Kimberly, what, was, uh, what, what did you want to be? Well, when I tell you, you'll be a little bit surprised about where I am now, but when I was a little girl, I wanted to initially follow my mother's dance steps. She was a ballerina and actually she's on the call today and will be 90 in May, but she was a beautiful ballerina and I studied dance for my first years. Um, and then I was too lazy to be great at it. So I, um, but I fell in love with theater and I started studying acting and actually studied with some of the premier, when I was a teenager, the premier uh, acting uh, teachers in America and actually was on a TV show when I was 18 and a freshman at UCLA. Um, and, but um, the things that pivoted me because uh, I ended up going to law school um, was when I spent my junior year abroad in Paris. I, uh, while I was away there, I really became influenced about the idea of of applying my, my intellectual skills to something uh, a little bit uh, uh, more practical than acting. It was a very difficult business. I learned that when I, when I was trying to be an actor. And, um, and I had started studying French when I was 15. So that was very pivotal for me. I fell in love with it. I got really good at it. I went to Europe. I came back. I went back again and did a master's in French private law. Um, and then I got involved in politics when I was um, practicing law in my 20s. And that was where I met John, who was also involved in politics. And that's how I got to the Clinton White House. And then getting involved with Human Rights Watch after that. So these were all big kind of stepping stones towards where I am today. Well, since we have a whole um, Amazon fan club with us today, maybe all the Amazon fan club could wave so that we know um, <laughs> where they are. And um, <laughs> and I'm not going to ask. Them. <laughs> I saw you, Sarah. 
And I'm not going to ask you how your dancing, how, how your girls find your dancing skills. Um, oh, it's very do, entertaining for them. <laughs> we'll, do that, we'll do that afterwards. Um, then I'm going to ask them to do some imitations. Um, oh, but, no. <laughs> Coming back to Utah, um, since we already heard from Kimberly what was a turning point um, in her life or pivotal point going to France and having that exposure, um, what was your pivotal point in your life where you would say, I mean, that really influenced you? Um, there were many, but actually thinking about it, I think it was not the only or the one turning point. I think looking back, there were so many. And at the time when I chose journalism, I thought that was it. This will always be my profession. I loved it. It was like a total dream job. Little did I know that I had to sort of revamp and reinvent myself and my career so many times. And this is really a key lesson I learned that it's never sort of going to stop and to be all good. You always have to continue and proceed and to try to you know, make the most of it where you are. Um, that's why I would really encourage everybody, especially women, um, don't shy away from starting all over, you know, founding something. I founded my Disput Berlin, my, my startup, writing books. So it was a whole yeah, different, a multitude of different things, which in the end, I think makes make sense altogether because it has to do with communication, with PR, with understanding and with writing and curiosity, uh, but it's a whole mix of different influences from life and people you meet, you'd all take into account, and this is actually shaping your life. So the one pivotal point um, would be difficult for me to say, maybe Kimberly has said one pivotal point. If I, if I may ask you, to, because you mentioned it, you had to reinvent your, or you reinvented yourself um, several times. Were you ever afraid um, or, or scared um, to reinvent and do some, something else? No, not really. I, I knew when, before we went to Washington DC, I was bureau chief of my, my paper. And then we went after Washington, we went to London. So I started uh, writing this book and doing this and doing that. Um, no, I wasn't. I wasn't scared, but you have to. Um, you have to be imaginative and have to. Um, you know, have have some visions where you want to go, um, and you have to be. You know, confident and um, yeah, use count the blessings you have and use them. I think courage is one of the um, a really important quality, um, and you know. Uh, we all have these really strong critics. Uh, and I would say that I'm not gonna define it by gender, but I know a lot of female friends that have really strong critics that, you know, are always telling them they're not good enough and they haven't accomplished enough. And, um, you know, we're, we tend to always wanna cross every T and dot every I before we think we're qualified to do something. And the, you know, many have perfectionist streaks. I am guilty of that as well. And I know I have my daughters have a little bit of that as well. And um, you know, it's really important to be able to see when you're kind of damaging your own self by your own uh, negativity, and that you actually can say, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! That's over there. That's not who I am." and that you can step into the unknown um, mm. and know that you are still who you are and you are bringing what you have, your skills, your talents, your personality, your soul to whatever you're doing. So I know we got off in a little bit of a, we, I know we wanna get around to diplomacy, but I just wanted to tee off of what uh, Yuta was saying. I, but then, when I may add, I would like to say that there might be even a transatlantic difference between even women see their own job, their, their professional life. I always encountered that under Americans, it's more, it's more thinking big. And they really follow their passions against all odds. Sometimes in Germany, it seems to me that sort of the combination of work life and family is replacing a passion. So German young girls and women tend to, to juggle this and losing a little bit out of sight, the vision 
and uh, the possibilities they have. I, I met an American professor one day and she, she told me she's telling her young students all the time, hey girls, don't be afraid, don't be scared. Think how you can choose a job and make a difference in the next decade. And I think this is something rather American. Germans are more hesitant, scared. So, you know, there might be some joint empowerment initiative we could sort of do together because we could really learn here a little bit from the Americans, I think. I mean, great idea. I, I see it slightly differently, but I, I appreciate uh, you to what you say, and I, I can understand why you might feel that way. I think that um, Americans, you know, there's, we have a little bit more of that entrepreneurial spirit that can be applied in whatever we do. Um, and, and the whole idea of the American dream was like, you can follow your passion and do what you want to do. And now in reality, that's not always true. I mean, people are limited here by um, their, you know, demographics, um, where they grow up, um, the culture that's around them, the encouragement they have. But I, I myself am a product of the American dream. I mean, I grew up with a single working mother and um, it very, very much, uh, you know, uh, at times uh, we struggled. And, you know, I have been able to, to accomplish many things in my life that I never even dreamed of. Um, and so perhaps that's, that's, that's emblematic of, of the world in which I grew up, but I don't think it's true for everybody all the time here. You know, I do think there are a oh, lot of barriers as we know um, in our but social system. There might be a general difference, but of course it's not true for everybody, but as a tendency, yeah. I found that many times. Yeah. yeah. We see, we see that um, in the startup scenes that there is definitely a difference, that there is more entrepreneurship because there's also a greater forgiveness for making mistakes, I would say, in, in the United States. Here, it's, it's very easy to be stigmatized if you do something wrong. Um, and it really, um, I mean, you really <laughs> have to work hard then to get rid of that stigma of failure. Um, but failing is something which is a great um, achievement, so to say, on the way to invent something new. And I think in, there's a little bit of a difference, um, I think. Both of you mentioned you have to reinvent yourself, you have to be courageous, um, you have to find your own spot. And that brings me um, to the time, Kimberly, you spent in Berlin um, and as the ambassador's wife, and Jutta, you spent in Washington as the ambassador's wife. This was a reinvention for, for two power women as you yourself. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit more about this period. Um, first of all, um, how were you, uh, I mean, how did your hus husband or you, uh, boy, I think it was your boyfriend at that time, Jutta, right? How did he break the news um, <laughs> that you wanted to go and you to come along? And then also how, you, how did you prepare yourself and how were you prepared by the system for, for these roles? And um, maybe we can start with Jutta and then um, with Kimberly. Yeah, as you um, hinted, um, Stormy Wolfgang and I were not even married at that time. So the change was rather sudden. And I remember Richard Holbrook at the time asking us, well, you are going to be in Washington without being married? Are you really sure? And he was really warning us this would be terrible. Washington being so conservative that an unmarried ambassadorial couple would simply be impossible. I said to him, Richard, look, we have a chancellor who is on his fourth wife. We have a foreign minister who is also on his fourth wife. So, you know, I think we can handle that. And we arrived in Washington and then there was a first test, Wolfgang getting his credentials in the White House. Again, Holbrook had said, please Wolfgang, better go alone, otherwise it might be unpleasant. So Wolfgang in fact went alone. I was even not in, I wasn't in Washington. I was in Germany, everything went fine. Six months later, the new Dutch ambassador and his girlfriend, they sort of didn't have a Holbrook who was warning them. So they went together in the White House and President Bush after some time said to them, well, I hear you are not married. So when will be the wedding? So the Dutch ambassador at the time said, well, we plan to get married next year. 
And then President Bush said, next year? What about this year? And sure enough, after six months, they were married. So that was like quite a, a culture clash, you know, when, when we came into Washington, D.C. And I was, I was not really prepared in any formal way. I think as Kimberly might have had these formal classes from the foreign, uh, foreign office. It was, I felt at that time totally well prepared. I mean, I had met all the most important politicians, had traveled the world, and I thought nothing could happen to me. And in fact, nothing happened to me, no, nothing bad on the contrary. But it was a whole different world, I have to admit. Suddenly, you were the partner of an ambassador who was called His Excellency, you know, and you have to sort of find your way, your own ways of creating your own sphere and understanding your mission, like, you know, what are you going to do? Make yourself understood, try to, yeah, promote a Germany picture, make Americans understand what are the Germans doings and why, why do we act the way we act? And in the end, um, I loved it. I loved it. And, but there was no formal preparation. I think it was really learning on the job. Thank you so much. Especially, I, I love the anecdote with Bush. Um, <laughs> that's just wonderful. Kimberly, how was it for you? Um, so because John was a political appointee, obviously it was one of those touch and go. Um, literally, he got a call, you know, right after the election. Please uh, give us a list of the top you know, three countries that you would be interested in serving at the president, you know, would like to consider you for this job. And then it was like months of silence and nervousness, not knowing. So we were both kind of in it together and I was excited and I was scared. Like, would he get it? Would he not get it? This would be great. And then about five months later, you know, he was formally announced as someone they already had pre-vetted him. You know, in the United States, we do this like very deep vetting of uh, potential ambassadorial uh, nominees. And then once you're announced, so then that was exciting, but then the real work began. And it was literally from March until we got on a plane in the middle of August of 2013, um, running back and forth from Los Angeles to Washington DC for all kinds of uh, bureaucracy, <laughs> um, lots and lots of stuff to do bureaucratically. And um, I was trying to learn German. I had a little hubris about learning German because I spoke French fluently and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a linguist, I can do this. And unfortunately finding a German, a good German program here with, you know, that you could do once a week, which is all the time I had, it was almost impossible. I found a, a, an elderly, lovely German, former German teacher who came to the house once a week and unfortunately preferred telling stories to teaching German. So um, I kind of put that aside and said, okay, I'll focus on it when I'm there, ha ha. And then we do have a, a foreign service institute in Washington that's, um, we call it charm school. Um, where amb all ambassadorial nominees, all of those who are going through the, con you know, the confirmation process have to go. And it's a two week program that I think has been extended to three weeks. And, you know, the first couple of weeks, hey, you know, we were together and learning, but, you know, it was everything from what are the substantive issues that you're going to be facing at post to think about you know, diplomacy events like dog diplomacy and 4th of July parties to, um, which are also important because those are the people to people events. But then we also had like the Office of Inspector General and the Ethics Office come in and tell us like horror stories of ambassadors who had caused international incidents, created embarrassment for the country, um, had to be recalled to the United States. Some of them were political appointees, some of them were career, but they were definitely trying to put a fear factor into us, like don't do anything wrong. And um, so we were, we were like, after that class, we were all like super confused about how we could get in trouble, but we were also like, okay, we're gonna have to rely on the people at post. Um, you know, packing up our house and getting ready to leave and lease it um, was an entire summer event. And 
when I tell you that John and I decided to ship our entire very small wine cellar over to Berlin because we had all these California wines and we were like, well, part of our deal is we want to share California with, you know, our German counterparts. And so um, we decided to do that. But at the same time, we had these old bottles in our cellar and we weren't sure if they were good or not. And we didn't want to try them out as a public diplomacy fiasco in Germany. So we thought, okay, we have to drink them this summer. So I think one of the more entertaining moments was sitting at my bar going, you know, with boxes all around me and paperwork in front of me and my computer open, drinking like a Cabernet Sauvignon from the 1980s. Um, I have to say that we were also really, really helped by our predecessors, Bill and Tammy Murphy, who uh, you all, many of you know and were fantastic, uh, also fantastic ambassadorial couple. Uh, we were so lucky to, to, to follow their footsteps to Germany. And literally they got home, they did their 4th of July party on 2013, got back to New Jersey and literally John and I were with them 24 hours later because you know we were getting we were like in the like our time was like pressing on us and we spent you know a night with them where they just downloaded all the people that we had you know the wise people we had to meet and I must note that Wolf Ping Issinger and Yuta were on that list as these are two of the people you have to meet in your first month and you know this is what we did this is the kind of parties we held. And of course, we took it and made it our own, but their advice was invaluable. Yeah. Kimberly, let me just jump in here because I will start. I think all preparations and all advice would have been in vain because actually our first day in Washington, D.C. was 9-11, 2001. So we were unpacking our suitcases when the planes crashed into the World Trade Center. And then later on, I could see on my TV screen, unpacking my suitcase, uh, flames coming up from the Pentagon. So that was not really about parties. We had to think, how can we sort of make sure the embassy is safe? And a uh, whole of Georgetown was like a war zone. We had helicopters over Georgetown. And um, the, the government was at an unlocated place. It was really quite a disaster. And then in the aftermath, when I thought I will have, have a smooth introduction into um, diplomatic life, what happened? Everything OK? You hear me? Everything OK. Yeah. I heard you here perfectly. So, yeah. So there was no smooth introduction. But uh, you know, we had then uh, Wolfgang had to speak with the embassy 24 hours a day with, with the embassy and the foreign office in, in Berlin. There was the un, unlimited solidarity which Chancellor Schroeder expressed at the time. So the whole world was shaken up. So that was quite a, quite a bumpy start. I, I just wanted to add. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, I mean, that's a good segue for me to say that our start felt very smooth and then about a month after we arrived, a uh, little over a month after we arrived, the US government shut down for the third longest shutdown in its history. And, you know, we had, and then when you're there in your first hundred days and we were what we call drinking from a fire hose um, and our schedule was exploding and we were like blind with like everything that was incoming and trying to figure out what we were, you know, what we were doing then to have this kind of, government crisis, which was both a practical crisis for us because we had to cancel every public event and we happened to have former President Bill Clinton coming to visit us. And we had this big thing set up that where we could you know, do a public diplomacy event that we had to cancel. And we just brought him into the embassy and did a town hall with him. And then, um, but also it was, it was a public diplomacy issue because it was an image issue. I mean, you know, Germans were looking at the United States and saying, how come like every year you guys come up to the edge of the cliff on a budget crisis and it's this, you know, partisan football um, that gets bounced around. And so we were also dealing with explaining that. So that was the first crisis. And then two weeks after, two weeks after the government reopened and it was like a 17 day shutdown um, and we were also really worried for employees and whether they would be furloughed, but fortunately they weren't, the staff at the embassy. Two weeks after that, 
was the crisis that marked, um, I think, our entire four years there, which was Handygate. Um, that was only two weeks after the shutdown uh, when the uh, Snowden leaks, uh, some of the Snowden leaks uh, showed uh, or accused uh, the US government of spying on listening into Angela Merkel's phone, uh, mobile. And, um, you know, I'm happy to expound on that more, but that, that, that was something where we ended up, John was under huge fire, was convoked by the foreign ministry. Um, it was, it was uh, foreign minister Vesavella at the time um, and had to do what we called the perp walk. Um, if you know that expression in English, um, he had to go in and get basically diplomatically, um, uh, you know, yelled at uh, because the United States. And for us, it was like we had come thinking, you know, wow, we're just going to like strengthen. We knew the NSA thing was had happened. Um, there had also been this cable leaking earlier in the uh, the year before um, that had where the the cables basically indicated that some of the counterparts of German government officials were saying some pretty blunt things about those officials. So there was that crisis. And then all of a sudden you had the, the Snowden NSA crisis. And um, it was kind of this drip, drip, drip of leaks. And then of course there was this big one in uh, early November. And that, that ended up, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of stories around that. If you read my book, you'll be able to read some of them. But um, it was a difficult time for us. And, and it literally took six months for us to, you know, Stormy, in the beginning, you said, you know, the transatlantic relationship was so strong. It was, it, 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 we, 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 we stopped the bleeding. And um, I, I give great credit to John for his strategy and his team's strategy at the embassy for how they managed it. But it took six months um, to really try to reset those relations. And then a little later, there were also the negotiations for the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with 200,000 people on the streets of Berlin um, yeah. demonstrating against that trade deal and also in parts against the closer cooperation with the United States. So also not so easy times. Before I open it up for discussion, um, I would like to ask you both a question on diplomacy, public diplomacy. And um, since you followed public diplomacy for a long time, um, being part of it, but also covering it, um, looking from a bird's perspective on it. Um, I would like to know from you if you think that public diplomacy has changed um, over the last um, years. Um, and again, I would like to start with Jutta. Um, is public diplomacy still the same as 10 years ago, or is it different? Um, I would definitely say that the social media came into it, and now it matters really a lot how many followers um, an ambassador has, how he is interacting, the embassy is interacting on Facebook and all the other platforms. We mentioned Clubhouse, which might be a future platform. Um, but yes, I do think, I mean, most on the, on the working level, the relations between two countries are done directly between the capitals and the ministries. So public diplomacy is more on an informal scale where you can really, um, you know, help the, the other country, the other society to understand what you do and why you do it. And um, when, when we were in DC, we were uh, moving into this rather intimidating building at the time, the, the Ungers building. And we, um, it was not popular at all in, in Washington. And so we thought of how could we sort of make it more human? And an American friend of ours told us, get a dog. So we got a dog, we um, established, I, I furnished something like the Berlin bar in the basement where we had all, um, you know, the Washington power workers gather. So of course, diplomacy is always interacting between the elites of different countries. But for me at some stage, I kept wondering if it's really enough to interact with the elites there. I mean, because these people come to embassy events, you meet them all the time. 
uh, I do think the future challenge would be also to reach a broader audience, not only an American audience on the East Coast or the West Coast or the, the arts in the elites in arts, culture and economy, but actually reach more of the people in the middle of America where, you know, who have a great, not, not big knowledge always of Europe and Germany. So I think that would be the challenge of a future public diplomacy how do we reach them? I mean, basically the Trump voters, how do we make them um, have a more friendly attitude maybe to, to Europe? I think that's a really a big task. Before Can I, I hand over to you, Camille, I have to share a little anecdote. Um, and um, one, one of the things um, I look back very fondly are the Christmas carolings you did, the Christmas singing, the Christmas party. And we loved to, to go to your Christmas parties. And the last four years, every mid-December, my husband would be asking, so is there going to be an embassy Christmas party and caroling? And I'm like, no, honey, that is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> I, they, I, you're not the only person that has reminded us of them. Um, they were definitely one of our favorite events. Look, John and I, our whole attitude coming to Germany is our job is threefold, you know, represent the president, represent the United States, and then engage with the culture and the people. And the third tranche is really, I mean, the, the public diplomacy. Um, and you know, obviously that can be done formally. We do it formally with exchanges and um, uh, you know, cultural events, uh, which were great. Um, and I, because when I was at US, I was at the US Information Agency in the Clinton administration, that was actually the arm of the government. It's now part of the State Department. It's the Undersecretary of Public Diplomacy. That's what we did. So my, my training in public diplomacy goes back pretty far, about almost 30 years. And, um, and I've been uh, on the board of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. It's one of the only uh, uh, university uh, think tanks that studies and researches actually the area of public diplomacy and trains people, trains diplomats, but also business people in it. Because public diplomacy, you know, fires on all levels at, outside of the government. It's not just, you know, diplomacy is in the corridors of power, right? Where you're speaking government to government. Public diplomacy is on the balconies of power. You're in the public square. And it's how you're communicating your country and what it is and what its values are. And sometimes, you know, we were directing it and we were creating that to be able to communicate to Germany who we were. But a lot of times it's happening even outside of the channels of government. It is happening by people observing our media, by our sports teams, by our entertainment channels. I mean, look at the influences of American culture and what people think of America, what Germans think of America because of our culture, because of our music, because of our movies. So. John and I got there and our attitude was, we live not in the official ambassador's residence, we live in America's house. And we flung open the doors to that. So, you know, the Christmas party you came to with a couple hundred people, we did at least two of those. And we did seven other types of holiday, Christmas holiday type events. Um, in or with different constituencies and different groups to share what who we were and how we celebrate. We did the same thing with Thanksgiving. We we took this you know uh, one night a week. We turned it. We did three different nights of a hundred people seated dinner um, each of those nights, and we invited from a wide swath. But it's, it was still elite. So what John and I did is we actually were out of Berlin um, at least a couple of days a week somewhere in Germany. And we ended up visiting, although he, we argued about this last night, 130 unique places. We actually have a map where um, John had in his office where he put a red flag every time he went someplace different in Germany. And 
Um, I usually joined him and we had meetings with business leaders and meetings with um, you know, uh, government representatives. And we would sometimes do a public, uh, we'd visit universities, we'd go to be with students. Um, we would go to factories. We, we visited so many factories around Germany. We visited nature places. Um, we were up in Zult. We were up in the, the tidal parts below Zult, which were so beautiful, um, down in the Black Forest. And we felt that was really important part of our job was to go to as many places as possible. And of course, on the big cities, we were there, you know, 20 times to Hamburg or Frankfurt or, or Stuttgart or, or Munich. Um, and then always back in Berlin with a, with a smashed schedule of saying yes and going to places, but also inviting. Thank you so much. Now the floor is open um, to all of the questions of our audience. And you know, um, you can raise your hand um, via the um, little electronic hand sign. So you go on to participants and then under participants, you can raise your hand and don't be shy. This is your opportunity. I know that it's always hard um, to, to do so um, electronically and via Zoom, but um, this is, oh, and I see the first question. So it's um, uh, Wenzel Michalski. Please yes, support. hi. This is, this is a question to the both of you. So as being an ambassador's, embassies or ambassador's wives, what were your favorite moments, your best moments for you, Kimberly, in Germany and for you, Jutta, in America? Should I, do you want me to start? I, I'll give Jutta a couple minutes to think about it because um, <laughs> actually, <laughs> You know, I, I have to say one of the things I loved very much was inspiring young people. And um, in, I, I, you know, okay, I, now and then I got invited to come and teach high school classes or even elementary school classes, actually. And um, Wenzel is a, a colleague of mine from Human Rights Watch, um, our Germany director. And one of the things that I loved doing was to um, to actually share with young kids, like, you know, explaining the concept of human rights to them and the history of human rights. That was really something I love. And then, um, I don't know if you know, the, the Berlin, the, the, um, the, the UN program for high schoolers, it's called B-E-R-M-U-N and, and, and they bring high schoolers from all over it, like 700 of them to, um, Berlin and, they go through a training and it's actually a training in diplomacy in some ways and negotiation and conflict resolution over a number of days. And I, I love that. And I was invited to give the opening keynote in our final year in Germany. And I think that was probably one of the most satisfying um, moments I had. Yeah, for me, it's a, it's a twofold answer. I think the most important personal moment, or there were two, when my husband and I got married in Annapolis, we got married um, you know, in the United States. Um, and then uh, a year or two later, we had our daughter born also in Georgetown Hospital, Washington DC. So that was really, really great and very touching. Um, on the MPC level, I, <clears throat> I thought the embassy should get engaged in some sort of neighborhood work. And what we had, we had the very good German American school, the German high school in Potomac. And what we did, we introduced the German American scholarship program where we had kids from inner city schools from, from DC transported to the German school. They just had a very minimum amount of two hours German lesson, but then they could enter the German school and get a proper high school education. And when those first kids entered the German school on this scholarship program, I was really, really happy. Hmm. Great story. Thank you so much. Those are two wonderful moments. Um, our next question um, or comment is by Ralf Lange. Um, Mr. Lange, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Nice to see you all here. It's great. 
Um, I have a question to these ladies, uh, to, uh, because um, you mentioned in the beginning of your speech about young people here in Germany getting maybe a little bit more, let's say, carefully ambitious. What kind of advice would you give them for um, to, to studying, let's say, not their career, but their personal development? If before they go to university or to discover their own talents, what kind of uh, advice would come from you? Before I um, hand over again, I think we need to um, collect a few questions. Um, otherwise, we won't get because now they are coming in. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to take one more question on board before I um, hand it back. And the um, next person on my list is Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Binder. Binder. And um, then I come back to a second round with Jeremias Kettner. Oh, oh you Could uh, um, governments make of uh, ambassadors' wives uh, or um, ambassadors' um, husbands um, in the sense of take two for the price of one, because that's what it is, but you don't get paid or you didn't get paid, for instance. Do you have any suggestions what could be changed or should be changed? Everything. <laughs> I think uh, everything, everything uh, should be changed. Because okay. When you enter, when you enter like the diplomatic mission, you are like a non-person. You don't really exist on any any employees list or even on the internet. I remember once there was a fire alarm in Washington DC. And I was quite scared. I packed my suitcase and you know went outside of the embassy, and I was the only one there. Everybody else knew it was like a, a fake fire alarm, you know. And they they expect you to do a lot, but then when you do things and show initiative, they tell you you shouldn't have done that. So I think they should allow am ambassadors' wives and spouses, partners, men or women, to have their own job their own career and then maybe get a fair amount of money paid for the germany pay pr they do um, these days it's less and less easy for for spouses to join their partners abroad and we see in berlin uh, that a lot of people go alone without their families because um, you know marriages don't hold all the time and it's such an insecure business if you only follow your partner and sort of you, you give up your career. So I think the foreign office should really make a plan how, how spouses could yeah, continue their lives maybe abroad and also later on give some assistance. That would be my suggestion. Um, so I, I guess Elizabeth, I'll answer your, hi Elizabeth. I'll answer your question first, and then I'll go back to Ralph's question. Um, so just to say that, you know, what, what Yuta says about um, the foreign office and their treatment of spouses uh, is very, actually is not dissimilar from, uh, unfortunately, the State Department. Um, and I know that I would not be the first to say that uh, there is a uh, a little bit still of a, a throwback to the 1950s cultural um, uh, cultural legacy there. And, um, you know, when I went to uh, ambassadorial training, uh, there was a day where uh, the spouses were segregated and, and uh, had their own uh, exchange, uh, had their own uh, trainer who basically went through all of the restrictions about what we were not allowed to do. Um, and they told us that we had no direct authority while we were abroad. We only had derived authority through our husbands. They um, told us that uh, we were not allowed to ride in the official vehicle, the secure vehicle without our husband in the car, um, or we could get in trouble. Um, they said that, um, they suggested, they said even the house staff did not report to us that we had to, you know, that was even though you end up working with them closely, but still, you're always on notice that, you know, you're not in charge. And That's then true. the other thing was that um, they, they, they even suggested, and this is what kind of almost threw me uh, into uh, 
a, a fit was uh, that we should come up with, you know, safe crafts, you know, craft, doing crafts with other wives, et cetera, um, baking circles, things like that. So um, I, I literally got back to John that night and I said, I, I don't want to go. I was with another girlfriend who was also a very independent, powerful person. And we were both complaining crazily saying, we don't want to go. We don't want to go. This is terrible. <laughs> and um, ultimately, uh, but what to fast forward, I, the, during the Obama administration, the State Department, actually the head of the Foreign Service Institute, which was Nancy McEldowney, Ambassador Nancy McEldowney, who's a career ambassador, who is now Kamala Harris's national security advisor, but then invited three ambassadorial couples back to Washington for a workshop in which we were to basically sit down and help them think through how to improve the training process. And we hijacked part of it to talk about the role of spouses. And so at a certain point, um, when I got there, I had to hire my own assistant, my own driver. And in fact, my, my wonderful former assistant, Marian Denatson, who is now uh, running uh, programming at the German American Institute in Stuttgart is on with us today. So hi, Marian, um, great to see you. But um, the fact is, is that we actually, I just, I just at a certain point, I worked with the embassy and did some things with them when I could. And then I just struck off on my own, but there is, so there's, it can only go up. <laughs> it can only go, there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. Um, Stormy, do you want me to just quickly, I can also quickly, I know we're running out of time, just quickly address Ralph's question about kind of what my advice would be to a young person who wants to sit where I am. I, I just, why you know, don't we keep, why or don't do you want to? I would like to keep that for the very end. Okay, for let's get to the end for both, and get the other two questions. Get the other two questions. And then I also would like to do an experiment because we haven't heard from any young people yet, younger people yet on this call. And I know there are some young people on this call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one of our young people here um, is uh, Bennett. He's one of our interns right now. So Bennett, think um, what you would like to ask uh, Kimberly. And I know they just turned off their camera, Haley and Taylor. Um, if you could turn on your camera again, if you're hearing us. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think about a question you would like to ask Jutta. And I'm gonna come back to you too, just in a second. So um, the next one, we have two more questions um, from our audience. One is um, by Jeremias Kettner. And the other one is by David um, on his iPhone. I think it's David Nauer. Um, so, Mr. Kettner, the floor is yours, and then David. Yeah, thanks, Stoy Miltner, for giving me the floor. I'm 36, so I would say mid aged. Yeah. <laughs> so, I have a question to both of you. Thanks for sharing these very interesting um, insights and anecdotes. I think that's almost the, the most important things you can learn on such a call. So we were talking about um, the duties and rights of um, spouses from ambassadors, but also their own uh, engagement and, and, and interest. So my question would be, do we have to think of that as a very strategic process where you have the embassy team also helping you and maybe some private advisors, or do you also can follow your own interests, let's say gut feeling and what you think you're really good because um, Ms. Jutta Falke said that you have to follow your instincts as well and do what you are the best in. So that's my question, thank you. And when, when I arrived in the embassy, um, shall I answer already? Yeah. No, not yet. We need to have oh, the others. Okay. Sorry. And then we have to answer it as a, as a package because we are running a little bit out of okay. time. <laughs> so da David, please. Hi Jutta and uh, hi Kimbo. Uh, it's been very interesting to listen to both of you. You're obviously both qualified, would be qualified to be ambassadors in your own right. So if you, if you were sent to Washington tomorrow, and Kimberly, if you were sent to Berlin tomorrow, what would be your one or two top priorities in today's world? Thank you so much. I Dave. love that question. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then I would like to hear from... Um, from our Haley and Taylor, if you have a question to Yuta, do you have a question to Yuta? 
Um, just thought of it real quickly, but um, maybe um, hopefully this makes sense. But um, just as young people and just as Americans, how we can um, still embolden and um, continue working with um, in German relations, maybe not in a role that necessarily like not being an ambassador role, like how do we continue to make those connections with ger young Germans and keeping that, you know, relationship that strong. Bond. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you so much, the two of you. Um, and Bennett, what is your question to Kimberly? Well, I could actually turn the question around of Haley and Taylor because it was also my, my question in that regard, but also how can you inspire young people to pursue the path of diplomacy? That would be really interesting for me to hear. Great, thank you so much to all of you. Um, I hand over to Jutta um, and Kimberly again for the last round um, of answers and anecdotes and experiences. Jutta, please. Yeah, um, coming, coming back to, to David's question, um, I think I would reopen all the Goethe Institutes which have been closed in the States and have as many German politicians travel also to the Midwest states, being involved in talk shows, in debates, just to get to know those people in the middle of America, which normally are not exposed as much to uh, German and European politicians. Um, the question to uh, Jer Jeremias, um, how do you um, motivate I motivate young young people to pursue their careers. I would um, I would say it's, it would be a great idea to do as many as possible internships and then find out what your passion is and then think big and proceed. And that would be also my answer to Haley and Taylor. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, so just starting, David, with your good question. You know, uh, one of the things that has been so difficult for me and John over the past four years is to see the deterioration of the uh, relationship, the transatlantic relationship, but in particular with Germany at a government to government level. And so um, my first my first priority would probably mirror a lot of what Biden, President Biden is trying to do, which is to basically, show Germany America is back. And that would be by re-engaging bilaterally with the government as quickly as possible as we already are doing and um, finding all those common opportunities and challenges that we can pursue together, whether you know climate change probably being at the top of the list, yeah. um, but also working with Germany on how to reform some of the multilateral institutions that really need to, um, you know, are, are really important uh, for us to address uh, global issues, uh, but that absolutely do need some changes such as the WTO, the WHO, even the UN Human Rights Council. Um, but that's something that we're so ready and able to do with Germany. I would also say that, you know, to make clear, I, I think I think that, you know, there was a period of time where it looked like there was an investment, uh, a little bit of a, um, what I would call a fake, they called the fake trade war uh, going on with Germany. And just to the extent that, you know, I could uh, reassure German businesses uh, of America's both commitment to their presence in America and American businesses presence in Germany. I think that's really important. I think economic diplomacy is, 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 is key. Um, there's a lot of other priorities as well, but those would be kind of at the top of my list. Jeremiah, um, I thought your question was a little bit uh, about uh, public diplomacy priorities and uh, whether you worked with uh, or uh, uh, the embassy staff on them. So I would say it was a combination of the two. Um, for me, I uh, focused on women's empowerment and, and tech stuff with internally with the embassy. And I, I shifted it and changed it and really tried to uh, turn that into an ongoing, ongoing projects. Uh, but I also independently 
uh, when I saw that they weren't going to keep me busy enough at the embassy, I just set out on my own and I started accepting invitations and I just, you know, used my curiosity to uh, go into the art world and go into the style world. These are huge creative industries um, where the embassy had never played before. Um, and, you know, I'm human rights is my heart and soul and I brought it with me and I um, got deeply involved in representing human rights when I was in Germany. And that extended to the refugee crisis where I also um, uh, uh, helped lead embassy efforts. So it was a combination of things I wanted to do and things that I could get them to do with me. Um, but I had to convince them it was part of the president's mission. And then to Bennett, to your question on, you know, what would somebody do if they wanted to do public diplomacy? Um, I would say, first of all, get on an exchange program. I just think that's the best way. You are a natural public diplomat when you go and live in another country. And every person I know who has done any kind of exchange, whether in Germany or in the United States, has come back a different person. And they look at the country differently. The experiential uh, opportunity absolutely transforms you. And I think that's the beginning. Um, Stormy, did you want us to quickly give advice about, because that, in a way that leads a little bit into what I think young people should do, which is, you know, follow their passion and prepare and find mentors and commit 110% to whatever you do, seize opportunities, be courageous, be curious, practice gratitude and humility, and finally listen with your heart and listen to your heart. And that would be my final advice to young people. Yeah, and I, I would agree with Kimberly. And Kimberly, in fact, I think you should start tomorrow. Has President Biden decided already whom to send? <laughs> The list. <laughs> there are many, many, many incredible people on the the list for um, the, the the to be. It's incredible. Every I have to say, it's it's like, you know, Trump couldn't Trump Trump's ambassadors couldn't get arrested. You know what I'm saying? Like they came out of nowhere. He didn't really have it. And Biden's a guy who's been in you know been in this. Uh, world of politics for 50 years. He's got, I call them FOJs, friends of Joe. He's got a billion friends of Joe out there. So yeah, whoever comes to Germany, I assure you will be an extraordinary person. And it will be a wonderful, I think it will be wonderful for Germany. I'm really excited for the future for y'all. Hmm. And Jutta, your advice to young people? Um. As I said before, um, follow your passion and try as many internships as you can and then think big, think big. Don't let yourself be sort of slowed down by, by structures. Just follow, follow your passion and carry on. Great, thank you so much to both of you. This has been a wonderful, wonderful event. Um, when we announced it um, on social media, um, I said that you all would have the um, opportunity to meet two women who are brilliant, charming, and engaging. I would add so many other adjectives to it. Brainy, highly intelligent, beautiful, great fun, and compassionate. And as I um, started in the beginning, real great role models uh, for women, um, not just in the United States and in Germany, but in many other countries. Thank you so much um, for being this, uh, those, for being who you are and sharing this uh, tonight with us. Thank you so much. This unfortunately concludes our event. Yeah. Stormy, you thank you all. And Stormy, thank you and Aspen for actually having this uh, yeah, wonderful thank you for chat. Us. It was great. It's been wonderful. And you see Thank many you. of you again. Um, stay, stay Aspen friends or become Aspen friends, become Aspen members. We have lots to offer. And um, I hope to see you all soon again. Um, take care, stay healthy, and thanks for joining us tonight. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Two of you. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Bye. Bye. Tschüss. Tschüss.